most of us are very familiar with the Gospels, and rightfully so. Um, we learn about Christ, um, all of his teachings there. It's, uh, we're, our familiarity with it um, can be a good thing, but it can also cause us to miss some really important things. Um, last week, uh, Dr. Nacelli, Andy Nacelli, read a children's book during Bible study hour, so I thought I'd continue the trend. No, not really. Um, what I have here, though, is a book that most of you probably know. Um, and when I read, read books as a kid, you miss a lot of things. Um, and when you become, I don't know if you, any of you have had this experience, but as you grow and as you, uh, you become an adult and you read those books to your kids, the books that you read um, as a child, uh, you're familiar with the book, but all of a sudden you're seeing things in a new light, right? You're, you're noticing things that you never noticed before. Um, you know, you always thought Corduroy was a story about uh, a bear who lost his button, but, but Corduroy is a story about materialism. It's identity, friendship. Thank you, Crystal. Are you laughing? <laughs> we have this, uh, uh, the people in this book that are realizing um, and it's all about what you really want. Uh, I've always wanted a bear. I've always wanted to live in a palace. I've always wanted a friend. I've always wanted to have a home. Okay, maybe I'm taking this a little bit far. The point is that we can become so familiar with something that we're missing the depth. There's, there's more to it. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the book of Matthew and the Gospels in general. But today, I'd like to step back to ask a few questions about the Gospels in general before we jump into studying them. So, we're going to start off with what is a gospel? You have it on your handout. What is a gospel? Um, you actually have the first question. Before we get to what is a gospel, what is the gospel? Um, and I think this is important to understand, just what is the gospel? Um, the word gospel means good news. Good news that brings joy to the hearer. Like in Luke chapter 2 verse 10, the angel said to them, the, the shepherds, fear not for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. So why do we call news good? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's called good because of what it means for us. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you call something good, your, your house is finally ready to move into, your sports team just won a game, uh, you're having another grandchild born into the family. We usually describe news as good or bad depending on what it means for us. One of the places where the Bible uh, clearly describes the news that is good for us is in 1 Corinthians 15. Many, many have observed 1 Corinthians 15, um, 1 through 4, providing a, a really concise summary of, of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he, raised, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So when we talk, about, we talk about the Gospels, about the good news, we turn our attention to the Passion Week, the week of Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. And that's exactly what the Gospels, what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do. The, path, the Passion Week makes up a huge portion of the Gospel accounts. In Matthew um, and in Mark, it's about a third of the book is just focused on, on that Passion Week, Christ died, buried, rose again. In Mark, it's, it's about a fourth of the book. But in John, it's half of the book is just that one week. Roughly one-third of the, the Gospels, 89 chapters, is devoted to Jesus' final week. And the other two-thirds of the, of the Gospels prepare for that final week. So um, Andy Nacelli, in his book on interpreting the New Testament, says, The heart of the Bible is the Gospels. And the heart of the Gospels is the sacrificial, redemptive work of Christ. The Gospels are essentially passion narratives with extended introductions. That's what he says. Passion narratives with extended introductions. We'll talk more about this in future weeks as we work through Matthew. But for now, just file this piece of information, important place in your mind. Um, the heart of the Bible is the Gospels. And the heart of the Gospels is the sacrificial, redemptive work of Christ. Now, is it accurate for us to refer to 
the gospel of the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as gospels. They only include, um, uh, they include much more content than just that Passion Week, right? It was a third, a fourth, half of the book, but is it accurate to refer to them, the whole book, as a gospel? Uh, we're getting to that, that second question here. What is a gospel? How can we call Matthew the gospel according to Matthew? So first of all, let's just, let's just note that um, the gospels de- describe, don't describe themselves as gospels. Uh, Mark 1.1 1, 1 actually says the, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he's, he's not referring to his written work with those words. He's referring to, to Christ, the beginning of his ministry, the beginning with uh, John the Baptist. The title of gospel was actually given to each of those books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, by the early church to remind us that there is really one gospel, the gospel according to Matthew. And that's the news about Jesus Christ, that, that one gospel. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12, says, I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ. There is one gospel. Philippians 1, 27, let your man- manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. The gospels are not just about salvation. The gospels are about a person. They're not primarily showing us how to be saved. They're showing us the one who saved us. So, if the gospels are ultimately about a person, we might ask the question, are the gospels biographies of Jesus? So let me just ask you that question. Uh, what are your thoughts? Are the, are the gospels biographies of Jesus? And there was silence. Yeah, yeah, not, primarily. not primarily. Why do you say that? That's not the point of All right. Good. Any other thoughts? Are the gospels biographies? Jonathan? Very selective part. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Yeah, you guys kind of hit it on, on the head there. They're, they're not like modern day biographies. Um, have any of you read The Last Lion? It's about Winston Churchill uh, by William Manchester, Paul Reed. It's, it's over 3,000 pages, I think. Um, I haven't read that. Uh, the gospel accounts, in contrast to that biography, are very selective. The gospel accounts, uh, Matthew and Luke, Uh, are the only Gospels that record Christ's birth. Mark and John just skip right to the beginning of his ministry. Only Luke records Jesus' um, growing up years, um, his his youth. We find him as a 12-year-old in the temple um, asking questions, answering questions of the um, scribes there. And then uh, he he just summarizes Jesus' childhood in one verse. Luke 2, 52 says that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Even when we get to Christ's ministry, um, the gospel authors only record some of his activity in that uh, three years of ministry, roughly, that, that he had. Uh, when it comes to the category of miracles, there's like 35 miracles that were recorded in the gospels of, of Christ. Um, and John's gospel actually only records seven of them. Monica mentioned there's a certain purpose for that. John 20 says, uh, verse 30 and verse 31, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The gospel writers were selective in what they included, not because they had a bad memory, but because they had purpose. They had a purpose in their writing. And it wasn't to produce a complete biography of Jesus' life. That's a category of miracles, but in the category of teaching, too, it's astounding. I mean, there's really a a pretty limited amount of teaching that's included for us in in the gospel. It's only a fraction of all that he had to say. I I did some work just finding a total of all the words that Jesus spoke um, throughout the gospels. And I tabulated something around 30,000 words, which may sound like a lot, but um, it isn't really a lot when you realize the fact that you could speak that in about three to four hours time. From Christ's entire life, 30 plus years, We only have about three to four hours of him actually speaking. If the gospel writers were trying to provide a comprehensive biography, they they failed. So back to our original question. What is a gospel? To simplify things for our discussion here today, I'm going to just define the gospel, define a gospel as an introduction 
to Jesus the Messiah with a concentration on his redemptive sacrificial work. Those of you like to fill in blanks, go and fill those blanks in. An introduction to Jesus the Messiah with a concentration on his redemptive sacrificial work. With that in mind, uh, we should take particular notice of the words and the works of Jesus. They're intentionally recorded by the authors. So it leads us to our next question, what is the purpose? What is the purpose of the gospel accounts? And to answer this, I'd actually like to take you to 1 John 1. Can you take your Bible? Hopefully all of you have a copy of it and turn to 1 John 1 with me. You might be asking me, why are we going to one of the epistles to learn about the purpose of the Gospels? Well, as John begins this epistle, 1 John, um, it's clear that he has something to say about what he wrote in his Gospel. I think it's really interesting. Instead of of following this, uh, and I had this up on the screens to show you, but you'll just have to look in your in your uh, copy of God's Word. Instead of following this typical like subject verb object uh, typical sentence structure, he he spends the first two verses emphasizing the object, the direct object of what he's saying. Um, and he strings along these phrases. He keeps using the word depending on what translation you have. Um, he uses the word what to emphasize the direct object before he gives us the verb. You probably won't see it there, depending on what translation you have. I have the, um, just for this, I'm reading the Holman Christian Standard Bible, um, and you'll see what I mean when I'm going to keep repeating this word, what. He begins this way, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. What is he talking about here? Who is he talking about here? Verse 2, that life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. He's talking about Christ, the Word. Remember John 1? Verse 3, what we have seen and heard, we also declare to you. That is what he did in the Gospels. John is talking about Christ, the one they had seen and heard and touched, the content of their testimony and the, their declaration is Jesus Christ. That is what we have in the Gospels. And he continues in verse 3 by giving the purpose. The purpose why he and other authors declared Christ, whom they had lived with and listened to. And in verse 3, so that you may have fellowship along with us. So here's one of the purpose, uh, purposes of the Gospels, fellowship. Number one, fellowship. Fellowship means to have in common, to share with. So when he says fellowship with us here in 1 John 1, you might be answering yourself, how can we have fellowship? What do we have in common with the apostles, right? But we weren't there walking and eating and talking with Christ. We didn't see his miracles. We didn't touch the scars in his hands and his side. We don't have the experience of living with Jesus, but we do have experience of Jesus living in us. John continues by explaining the fellowship that we have with the gospel writers is the fellowship that arises from and depends on our fellowship with Jesus Christ. End of the verse three, it says, indeed, truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So how did this happen? How does our, how does this happen? How does our reading of, say, Matthew, for example, um, result in fellowship with one another? What we have in the Gospels is the reason for what we have in common here today. What we have in the Gospels is what we have in common here today. As we look at Christ and consider his words and his works we have the opportunity to affirm our fellowship with Christ, our fellowship with one another. Um, just yesterday, someone was talking to me and they asked what 
sports, what, uh, what baseball team. The baseball season just started, for those of you who don't know. Uh, and they asked me what baseball team I liked, and I said that I'm from Atlanta, so I rooted for the Braves. And there was immediately a connection there, because they, had, they, they uh, were big fans of the Braves. Maybe you have a certain hobby. I don't know if it's shopping, or maybe it's working on cars, or competitive duck herding. I just looked up a number of hobbies, and that one popped up. Uh, that is a hobby, actually. Um, so whatever the hobby is, have you ever talked to someone and immediately you have fellowship, you have something in common with them. Have you looked around at our church lately? There's, have you ever, how about this, have you ever walked after like a Sunday service and began talking to someone and struggling began grasping for straws because you don't feel like you have a whole lot in common with that person? Studying Matthew together will result in fellowship because the subject of the book of Matthew is the one thing that we all have in common, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, John doesn't stop there. He goes on to provide another purpose for declaring Christ, um, as he and the other apostles do in the Gospels. We find it in verse 4. Verse 4, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Joy. That is the second purpose I have here. When he says he's writing these things, um, I think that's what he's been talking about in verses one through three. Um, I think it's fair to conclude that he's talking about the gospel uh, accounts of Christ. Um, Now the the word there before joy, uh, our joy, that word is like the subject of a lot of debate um, with different scholars. They're like, they think it's your joy or it's our joy. And there's different, there's a variant there that's, um, that makes them uh, go into that, that intense debate. But I don't think we have to restrict this to, to just John's joy or just the reader's joy. John and the other apostles recorded the gospel accounts for the joy of those who believe in Jesus, the Messiah. The gospel accounts are written so that we would have fellowship and joy in our Savior. We answered the question, what um, is a gospel? What is the gospel? And we found um, with what is what is a gospel, Matthew in particular here, um, we found that it is an introduction to Jesus the Messiah with a concentration on his redemptive sacrificial work. And the, the purposes for that introduction by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, introductions to Jesus, um, is number one, so they would have fellowship with one another. A fellowship that we have in common, uh, that we share in, in the Trinity with the apostles and other saints throughout history. That is our fellowship. And number two, that we would have joy that's complete, that is full. So, are you excited about studying the book of Matthew with me together? Wow. (laughs) I'm excited about studying this. Um, Next week, we're going to actually launch into that, um, looking at the background to the book, jumping into that first verse. Um, But again, we're looking here, just taking a broad overview of of what is a gospel? Why are they written? So I have one more question here. Actually, I have two, but um, before I get to that, um, my next question, that's a better way to say it, is why do we need four of them? Have you ever thought about that? Four gospels. Why do we need four of them? You may not be able to understand um, why your husband, husband has multiple versions of the same tool. You may not be able to understand why your wife has... Um, multiple versions of the same shoe, <clears throat> but I think we can all identify a few reasons for why there are four gospel accounts. What do you think? This is your time to talk. Why do you think there are four gospels? For different, for different reasons. All right. Different perspectives. Absolutely. Calvin? All right. Good. Yeah, these are all, all right. Any others? Yes. Corroboration, confirmation is another word. Um, I think it'd be helpful for us as we look at um, why there are four Gospels to actually look at, at Luke chapter 1. Would you turn there real quick? We're turning everywhere other than Matthew, and we'll get there next week. Um, but Luke chapter 1 um, provides, it, it, it's, it's fascinating because he begins his Gospel by admitting that he's not the first to compile Gospels. 
a narrative like this. Uh, in verse 4, he gives us a reason, a reason why he's writing yet another gospel. Verse 1, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. In other words, I'm not the first one to do this. Verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you. And I don't think he's saying that the other accounts were disorganized, um, disorderly, but he was aware that, um, and we'll see, that they weren't always chronologically uh, organized, arranged. So he continues in verse 4 with um, a reason for his writing. He says, That you, Theophilus, may have certainty, certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Apparently, uh, Theophilus has been taught about Christ, but Luke is giving an orderly account so that Theophilus will have certainty, confirmation that uh, he says is reliable and inaccurate. So I would say one of the first reasons uh, the first advantages for having four Gospels is, is confirmation. Confirmation. With, with multiple uh, Gospel accounts, we find names, geographic locations, times of day that, that are confirmed as consistent, as reliable. And any Jewish reader will understand this. Look at Deuteronomy 19.15 at the, the mouth of two or three witnesses. That is what we have in the Gospel accounts. Confirmation is one reason for four Gospels. Another would be perspective. Somebody mentioned this as well. Although Matthew and the other gospel writers were moved by the Holy Spirit as they were writing, they, they still had unique perspectives. This is what they were writing. If everyone at a worship service um, here today, um, and after they walked out, they, they wrote two paragraphs about what happened. I'm sure we would get a huge variety of, of content there, a variety of responses, because they come from a variety of perspectives what we find in the Gospels. Peter and John, uh, Peter who would have been involved with, with Mark's Gospel, um, and John, uh, the author there, they're both fishermen. We have Luke who's a, who's a professional, he's a physician. Matthew who's a civil official, he's a tax collector. Variety of perspectives coming here to introduce us to Christ. Confirmation, perspective. Thirdly, focus. It helps it's helpful to have four Gospels because these particular themes uh, that each other seems to be highlighting, drawing our special attention to. And we'll talk about some of those themes, particularly of Matthew next week as we jump into the book. Focus. Uh, fourthly, in interpretation. Interpretation. The Bible is its own uh, best commentary. It speaks to itself. When we do come across a more difficult passage, having those other Gospels um, to to be able to um, look at, um, give us a better understanding of, of those passages. And finally, completeness. Um, the four Gospels provide us with a more complete, though not comprehensive, uh, picture of the portrait of Christ. There's advantages to having those four Gospels, but there's also some disadvantages. Um, just want to mention those briefly. Um, some of them would be the apparent differences. Um, some would say contradictions within the Gospels, right? Um, there's differences between the different accounts that we have to reckon with. Um, there's sometimes when you have, a, you have four Gospels, you can overlook the distinctiveness among them. It's easy to conclude that they're all just about the same. Um, and I'd like to talk about this, about this distinctiveness a little bit more uh, because I think it's really important for us as we begin to study Matthew. Um, when, when, if you begin to compare the Gospels, <clears throat> it's easy to notice really quickly that, that John is completely different. So we put him in a category by himself in some ways. Um, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the, the synoptic Gospel. Synoptic is, just means seeing together. They, were, um, they record a lot of the same a content about Jesus' works and his words. Um, John <clears throat> has like 92% of peculiarities, um, unique content that he's providing. But um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, are very a lot more similar. Um, Matthew, 
Let's see, um, Luke has around 60% um, unique content. Matthew has 40% unique content. So even the fact that they are very similar, there are some really, um, there's, there's a lot of distinctions between them. Mark has about 7% unique, so he's um, the least there. But as we're studying the book of Matthew, um, how do you easily identify what is similar and what is distinct <clears throat> about each gospel? We talked about how it's actually important to recognize those, so how do you see that? Um, well, there's one <clears throat> um, person that has asked that question before. Actually, there's a lot of people. You're, we're not the first people to ask that question. Um, one of the first was, um, his name is Tatian, I might be messing up that name. Um, in 170 AD, he was a, a pupil of, of Justin Martyr, and he compiled and then created a kind of like a continuous narrative of uh, the four gospel accounts. And he called it um, a diatessaron, which means a harmony of the four. Um, he was not, he was the first to do this, but he wasn't the last. There's been many that have been produced since then, but <clears throat> um, I thought I'd just go ahead and, and sh show you one right here. Um, I think it's helpful because what it provides, this is, this is one of two um, major categories of, of uh, gospel harmonies. Um, one would be, uh, actually it was created in 1975, um, by a man who wanted his students to be able to really analyze each word and how they were different from the different gospels. So he presented kind of the horizontal, like the verses, left to right here, providing a, uh, the verse and then the next, <clears throat> the other gospel below, so you could see actually which words were, differently, were, were different. Um, in a parallel, um, what's called a, a parallel column format, and I'll just show you, I had it on the, the slides, but you can see a picture here of what it's like. It's basically writing the synoptic gospels here side by side, so you can compare what is absent from some of the gospels and what is additional to, to others. Um, and I think there's some benefits to this, um, this harmony of the Gospels. One is that you can follow the chronology of Jesus' life. Um, because some of the Gospels don't include certain stories about Christ, it's helpful to know, to see where the different pieces of Christ's life fit together. Not all the Gospel harmonies are chronological, but, um, but some of them help in this way. Um, secondly, harmony of the Gospels, um, seeing these four Gospels and how they work together, um, one of the benefits is that they, um, it identifies the unique uh, inclusions by the author. Matthew is the only one to conclude, include the account of the Magi coming from the east to see the king of the Jews. Luke is the only one who includes the story of Zechariah in the temple. John is the only one to include John the Baptist's proclamation, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And some of these unique components that the authors include um, support a certain theme that the author is trying to emphasize. That's another benefit then of the harmonies, that they helps you to recognize particular emphases of each gospel. It was actually a gospel harmony um, that, uh, that led Augustine to conclude that Matthew focused on Christ's royalty, that Mark uh, focused on Christ's humanity, uh, Luke on Christ's priesthood, and, and John on Christ's divinity. There's nothing magical about those um, conclusions, but it's helpful to be able to, to look at the Gospels and to compare them and to, to come to, the, to, to notice those emphases. And finally, it helps us to learn more about the, the possible solutions to different contradictions. I'm, I'm not sure that all the harmonies do this, but um, this, this one out here by um, Robert Thomas, Stanley Gundry, uh, do try to identify some of those differences and explain uh, why, provide some solutions. So um, for some people, seeing differences is kind of troubling. I don't know if any of you fall into that category. Um, and, and because of that, I want to just finish our lesson this morning by asking one more question. And that is, are the Gospels accurate? Are the Gospels accurate? When you sit down to read one of the Gospels, and I encourage you to do so, if you read uh, the book of Matthew, it takes like two and a half hours, I think. You could read through the entire book, which really is helpful in understanding um, where he's coming from. When you sit down to read one of the Gospels, do you ever say to yourself, um, I just wish I could be there myself. I, I wish that I could be an eyewitness. Maybe some of you have, have friends or acquaintances 
that are questioning the, the reliability, the veracity of the Bible. I know I've heard just in the last few weeks, a few of our young people, our, um, our teens, have had an opportunity to defend their faith before skeptics, before um, friends who, who doubted the reliability of God's word. Have you ever thought, I just wish my friend could be an eyewitness. They could see and believe. Maybe you even think, my faith is so weak. I Imagine what faith I could have um, if I could have seen and heard Christ in person. Just a few weeks ago, I was talking to, to one of you, and you came up to after the service and said, and said to me, one of the primary events um, that I would have loved to witness is when uh, John the Baptist lifted up his eyes and upon seeing Jesus said, behold, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Maybe you have similar thoughts. So here's the question. Is the Bible less trustworthy because we cannot see and touch and hear, as the Apostle John described in his epistle? Is it less trustworthy because we cannot see and hear and touch, as the Apostle John did? Well, Peter actually says the opposite. Would you turn to 1 Peter? 2 Peter, actually. 2 Peter chapter 1. In verse 16. <clears throat> I'm going to read for you. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then he goes on to relate the transfiguration in Matthew 17. One of the most visually astounding events ever witnessed by human eyes, right? It's right up there with Moses beholding the glory of God passing before him. Verse 17, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him and on the holy mountain. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the words of God, including the gospel accounts, is trustworthy. Not because we saw it in person, but because we were, John is saying, because we were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Um, our record is inspired by God. I mean, think about it. Sensory experiences, right? Um, they can be duplicated. They can be forgotten. They can be misrepresented. They can be misinterpreted, as, as Peter did there, right? He said, um, he suggested making a tabernacle um, there when he saw the transfiguration, misinterpreting these as sensory experience. But the inspired, of, inspired word of God is certain. Let me encourage you today that we have a reliable book in our hands. We can trust God's word, not just because um, prophecy of the Old Testament was fulfilled, fully confirmed, as Peter says in, in verse 19, but the spirit of God guided those authors as they recounted the life of Jesus Christ. We can be confident in the Bible that we hold in our hands. Even more, than having those sensory experiences that the apostles had. I mean, have you imagined, have you, have you thought about all those that did see Christ, touched Christ, and did not believe in Christ? I don't know how, um, how long um, it will take us to work through the entire book of Matthew, if God gives us that opportunity. Um, I know one respected uh, teacher pastor who took like 200 sermons to get through that. So I just want to warn you beforehand that that's probably not the approach we're going to have. But I do want to, um, to walk, not to run through this book. To consider um, the fact that this is an introduction to Jesus Christ, our Savior, and 
I'm glad that you're along with me as we walk. Let's pray.